Would you guys like some cookies? <laughs> I can put out the recipe. No, there's two more here. <laughs> but I'm bound to consume them. That's why I asked, because I don't want them taking my cookies. You know, I'm not going to put the mic up to your mouth while you're eating the cookies. Well, you can have a cookie. I'm just going to... has got long arms, you know this? Just not good. He's six foot five. Yeah. How tall are you? Not six five. Five foot fourteen. Five foot fourteen. You guys, how tall it is? Uh oh. Really, just stick it under the chair. I'm not gonna do that. Five foot fourteen. Six foot two. Six foot two. Five foot fourteen inches. Oh, actually, yeah. Well, welcome. Uh, how many? How many here were born in Renton? How many Renton birthers do we have here? Just one? You and me. Oh boy. Or just a block over that way. Yeah. He's a little disappointed that you exist because he would have loved to be singing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I was thinking for I was looking for breath well, yeah, for companionship. Yeah, for companionship. <laughs> well. Anyway. How did you learn about this event? How did you learn about this event? So called culture catalog or calendar. Rather. A, a local calendar, is it? Yes, so called South County Cultural. And that's calendar. what the uh, the city puts that out? Oh, okay. the Seattle Times? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, the Michelle Obama tour was sold out, so they referred yeah. us to this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're here for those who couldn't get back to Michelle. Michelle said she'd be by later tonight. Oh, did she? So good. I might want to stick around. <laughs> so. You are, we, we launched this book on Paul's birthday, October 28th, his 80th birthday. And since then, 80 years old, he's eating, so I'm not going to let him talk until he finishes chewing. 80 years old, and he, uh, he's been doing this column for nearly 40 years. Oop, i got to shake the mic. He's been doing the column for nearly 40 years in the Seattle Times. <laughs> And uh, this is, since October 28th, including October 28th, this is our 20th show. Oh, 21st. Our 21st, did we add one in the middle? No, we're, this, we're at 21. Wow. wow. I'm losing track. And we got two more to go. So, uh, this is, this is uh, 21, I guess. I, I think we've come of age. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> okay. So, what we begin every show with, just for fun, is, uh, is a short bio of Paul, who's contributed for these nearly four decades to Seattle history. And uh, you, you probably know that he does a, he's done a column in the Seattle Times since 1982. I've been working with him on it for about the last 12, 13 years. So about a third of the life of the column I've been involved. Uh, we put out a book together called Washington Then and Now in 2007. And this is the first book we've brought out uh, since then. So let's go forward and we'll begin. Let's see, I don't know. We're not going to hear much sound, so listen to my laptop and I'll you can maybe hear the, the sound here. So here we go. my head on this, but this is, so I'm going to tell the story of, of Paul's life. We're going to start when he was, when he was, uh, this is the war years, North Dakota, 1942, maybe 43, and, and uh, he calls this photo, I don't know, he's just going to Saving shoot. the world for democracy. Uh, world War II, 1942 or so. Yeah. Backyard of the Lutheran <coughs> Parsonage in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And, uh, so we were for love and Christianity and war. <laughs> there he is with his camouflage. You see the straw on top of the head? I think that's a nice guy. That's so, a, a fierce look. A fierce look indeed. I remember having uh, dreams about the war when I was this age. <laughs> so here he is a couple years before then uh, as the baby of the family. And he's sitting on the laps of his four brothers. 
and uh, it wasn't long. Well, let's go 15 years ago. Uh, I took a picture of all four of them together. Oh, so my. Uh, there's Paul in the photos. And Paul is now the last of the generation of photo pants. And that, that hat that I'm wearing that's, uh, was eaten by my dog. <laughs> Got a big hole in it right here. I, I always reach for it, and I thought, no, it'd be too embarrassing for, for my dog. <laughs> well, you just you've embarrassed him now publicly. <coughs> and here's you see that he sees the inconsistencies in my morality frequently. <laughs> here's Paul with his father, Reverend Theodore Dorpet. You know, we both are descended from reverence. My my grandfather was the pastor up the hill. And Paul's dad was a Lutheran. Of course, the, Luth the Lutherans drink wine. And we Presbyterians, we don't touch the stuff. Well, uh, lots of beer, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wine and beer. <laughs> yep. That's German area. Are you any Lutherans here? Right. Oh, Look at that, you know. I think we are. How about Presbyterians? <laughs> How about so beer drinkers? How about beer drinkers? Yeah. Beer drinkers. Yeah. <laughs> All the beer drinkers. <laughs> And we, don't, we don't want to leave that beer. Why not? Born Never did Christian. like it? Huh? Born again Christian. Oh, are you really? Oh, okay. You know, you my grandmother. They don't drink you beer. You can be a Presbyterian and be a born again Christian. You can. My grandmother, I was driving my grandparents down once to, to California, and she turned to me. Now, during the drive, I think I was in college, and she said, Lips that touch wine shall never touch wine. She also said that the moment that Jesus drank the wine, it turned into grape juice. It was denatured, which is definitely a philosophy of the Presbyterian. Well, let's go forward. There's Cherry Burkett. Here, this is Paul's mother, Cherry. There's his dad, Edith Garina, was her name. Yeah. Is this, you didn't really expect to learn this, did you, when he came down? No. no. How many this people is... knew about the healers? Oh, here we have some healers. Two, two people yeah. there. Okay. Well, let's do a quick rundown. The Helix was a, the first underground newspaper in the Northwest, and Paul founded in the mid-late 60s. And in 1967, I was 10 years old, and I would cut out the back, uh, the, the posters on the back of it, and put it on my wall to offend my mother. <laughs> what did they call me then? What did they call me? Generally, as a group, uh, a cultural, subcultural, <laughs> a hippie. Yeah. Right. And there were a few boarding records and so on that too. Well, so we, after, uh, along with the Helix, Paul became a concert promoter and he did a uh, multi day rock festival and performance festival on, uh, out near Sultan, Washington. It was called Sky River. And look at the line up there. Yeah. Did, did you go to it? We didn't go to it, but we knew about you it. You knew about it, yeah. Look at that lineup. You've got everything from everyone from Santana to the Young Bloods to Richard Pryor. It's uh, it was yeah, the, flo the floating bridge was there. Did you know the floating bridge? No, I don't, but I like the they name. Local band, yeah. the Seattle band. They're really, really very good too. Yeah. So he was a concert promoter, and here he is with his friend Tom Ro Tom Robbins, the novelist. Yeah. How many of you have read a novel by Tom Robbins? Quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. Then we're going to take a look at the, uh, the, the moment the rain stopped at the, at the Sky River Festival. This is a very famous picture. <laughs> this is Mud River. I got a letter in the mail yesterday. They call them emails. Yeah, yeah. And uh, someone said they knew who the person was in the middle of this, and they had them identified. Oh, really? So wow. all your questions about it and your doubts about knowing who they were. I mean, you could you not yeah, I mean. No, I've asked every, uh, every one of 20 audiences if there's anyone who was in this photo, and we have not found one yet. Looks like yeah. they're waiting for the inner urban. It does look like they're waiting for the inner urban. <laughs> Same sense of decoration. Oh, boy. Well, after another decade, end of the next decade, Paul started his uh, work as sort of our public historian. He, he created 294 glimpses of historic Seattle and sold it for the for 294 cents a penny. <laughs> and he sold how many copies? Well, that was a brilliant PR plan. Right? <laughs> Too bad there weren't a thousand images. <coughs> well, there were, but well, you, you can't make really, more money. You can't. You had to charge more. Yeah, so. <laughs>
But 294 was right there. Yeah, and it was me. all charity, it all went to charity. So he started that within six months. He'd started his call. Here he is standing with one of the one of the great figures in uh, uh, sort of they know written they Seattle history. Do you guys know? Anyone want to take a guess who this is? He had wrote a book that's never been out of wait, print. Wait a second. Ray Morgan. How did you know that? Did you go to class with him? No, I know him. Uh, I worked for the Department of History, and so so I got to know him. Uh, from there. When he was doing uh, reviews. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, great guy. He is a great guy, yeah. That's nice to know. I feel a uh, compassion and compete with, you know, with the guy right now, because he knew Murray. That's how he, Murray was strong enough in his kindness that he would bond people. So Paul would wander the city interviewing uh, interesting folks, and so we call upon you now with this slide to interview your elders, to talk to them about where they came from and what they've seen, because this is Lucy Campbell Coe, who in the 80s was a 90-plus-year-old uh, witness to the Seattle fire oh as a child. 89, 1889. Wow. And uh, she was one of four different, and they were all women that I met when I was first doing research on Seattle and environment, and I actually wrote a couple of books on Washington, too. So, and she, and the other three, all remember the fire. Yeah. Yeah, so one of those. So how old would she have been for the fire? Huh? How old was she for during the fire? She would have been four years old. Four years. Yeah. The people went up on the hill, first hill, right, to get away from the fire. And, and then they would look at her, you know, spend the night, you know, they'd care, I want to go to bed. No, you're not, you're staying here and watch the fire. <laughs> That's right. When, when my parents wanted me to remember something, they would beat me. You stay up now. They'd say, stay, stay up. up. And they and they lash me. And I just yeah, kidding, you know, you know, it's the opposite. Yeah, no, it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have no memories of childhood. <laughs> Let's jump forward to 2011. Paul and I have been working together for about seven years at this point. We did a show at Mohai, the old Mohai, called Now and Then. And it was comprised of our, our work around the state uh, and around the city. And we also brought our friend Berenger, a photographer from Paris, and she did repeats of photographs from Paris in the foyer. So we're looking now at the two of us, a picture taken by Berenger. And here she is, standing on Paul's back porch. And now, to finish off the biographical section, we're going to show you a minute-long video. Yes? I don't know who you are. You've not introduced yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really, I, I actually, you know, I, I, I'm almost I like famous in this process. Okay. I'm the photographer for the column for the past uh, dozen years. Gerard is also a thespian. He's a writer. He uh, does a lot of uh, theater. In fact, uh, in a few days, what is it? We already did it, didn't we? Yeah, we did. He did a, a yearly show called um, I'm in it. I'm getting old. Uh, count me out. A Rogue's Christmas. A Rogue's Christmas. Yeah. But essentially, I've been, I've been. Uh, uh, as Paul uh, doesn't care for heights or depths or inside or outside. I'm the one who climbs or people much. Or people much. <laughs> I'm the one who climbs up and takes the pictures now. Okay. So you're looking at my photos in the book and, Thank you. and um, let me tell you, you got you got relatives in Peoria, you got relatives in Bloomington, you got relatives in Mississippi, you're gonna want to get two or three of these books. Because this is a beautiful display of the city, his work. That is the city that's now. You can get rid of the history stuff. Just look at the contemporary photos. <coughs> and of course, everybody loves the history. So let's go forward now. I'm going to show you this minute long, uh, and it has nothing to do with anything except it's so delightful that we, we, we share it with you. It's kind of the end of Paul's biography. So watch this. Oh, that's incredible. He looks very much like me, doesn't he? He does. With the glasses, with the glasses. This is born in Paris in 2005. Okay. This is in Baron for the first time together. And we saw someone sitting at a table. And I took the video. How many times have you bumped into someone who looks exactly 
I just start to giggle when the camera begins to shake it. In another few seconds, watch as they, as they both look up at me with identical expressions. Okay, here it comes. Amazing. I just thought, can everyone see that? And here's the picture that Baron Jair took of the two of them together. He, it turns out that this guy, who she went back several years later and found him in central Paris, he is a Romanian Orthodox priest. Oh, well, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, Romanian. Yeah, yeah. How do you know that's not Paul? <laughs> no, I'm not sure of it. Really. Yeah. I, I never owned that hat. No. He didn't own it. He's owned similar hats, but not this one. But it really is. They could substitute for each other. Or, you, know, you could have a ring and <coughs> walk around doing history. What's he doing now? I, have, I don't know he's doing that. Well, he has a nice church. Did you tell him about his church? Well, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, his church was stored in one of the yeah. houses. So we're going to start now with the, the historic hundred. <clears throat> and we'll just pop on through. This is the we start with the very first column that appeared in the in the paper, January 17th, 1982. And the structure of the book is we follow the the progress of the column sequentially, not the uh, the chronology or the actual date of the of the pictures. So you're going from 82 to a column later in 82 to a column. Later or to 185. Finishing the book, the last column in the book is the last column in the book is the one published this last summer. Huh? So it follows the, the progress of the column. Well, it doesn't mean the now is last summer, but uh, the right. now is, yeah. And a couple years ago I went out and retook all of the original photographs and replaced them with a, with a, with a brand new now. Oh, oh, wow. So that's what you're looking at is the column updated and you see what was there, and in fact, much of what Paul took in the early, in the 80s and 90s, it's, these are all thens now. It's then and then, and now we see we get a few places. So here we are, this is the 63rd Coastal Artillery. It's 1919, they're being welcomed home by hordes of Seattleites. It's a huge street party. First World War is over, and the boys have come home. So flags festoon the city, the, uh, and we're looking right now at the corner of Fourth and Pike, so it's West Lake. That building does not exist here. This is that's gone. Let's look at it today. My job was to go back and find contemporary photos that had that had equivalent resonance or, or impact. And so sometimes I was successful, and other times I wasn't. I went back. On January 21st, 2017, for the largest march ever held in Seattle, and it's the Women's March, which I think had 400,000 people. Didn't that coincidence uh, with the election of the current? Uh... It did, but we're not going to talk about politics here. <laughs> so, oh, you want to go back? Right here, that's the same building, which is the old, uh, it was originally a Bartels. And uh, now it's been replaced by one of those high-end clothing. Aster Asterix, or I don't know. They sell rocks. <laughs> Here's Paul's original photo, taken the fall of 81. And you see, even in 81, there's a barista <laughs> on the street corner. And she's holding the photo in her hands. Uh, yeah, when I, when I showed up, she had a lot. I've been expecting you. <laughs> she did not. 
Here's the first column in the book, and uh, so we, one thing we try to do is really keep these large. So we have some lovely full lead photos, uh, and sometimes they're the thens, and sometimes they're the nows. But um, we really try to try to make this book a bit of a spectacle here in Brown. We jump forward to the deepest snow, and this would have been a snow that would have fallen on Renton and Tacoma and Seattle. This was in 1880 and in Portland. This was 1880, and over a period of about a week, 64 inches fell. Is that the Peterson Brothers Studio? It, it, this is looking from the Peterson Brothers Studio, first to Cherry. Oh, we got Cherry. We've got a smart guy in front of us here. And it is a Peterson Brothers shot. So here we are, 1880, and Paul's not going to describe to you what these buildings are. You're a collector, right? Well, we yeah, we've worked on how they got the coal from Newcastle to Seattle, and yeah. Peterson Brothers had a lot of key photographs. You know um, Ron Edge? I do know Ron. Yeah. Oh, I know yeah, of Ron. Ron is the guy. I talked to you on the phone recently. No, not me. You talked to Kent Sullivan. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Kent is the research. Yeah, yeah. We missed that. This is uh, Yesler's Pavilion or Hall, which was the center of really a lot of social life, you know, sermons and parties and banquets and the like. And it was at the north, south, pardon me, southeast corner of Cherry Street and First Avenue. Now, how many of you, uh, you, you, you Rentonians, know where that is? One of you, most of you. Well, it's very close to Pioneer Square. You all know where Pioneer Square is. It's one block away. Get out of here. It's the most terrible. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's the uh, sheriff's home, one block behind him, that was Sheriff Wyckoff. He uh, died soon uh, about this time because he, he was stressed out by the anti-Chinese activities, you know, all the rioting and the like, and it, it blew his mind, he died. And then uh, up on 6th Avenue or 4th Avenue is the church, the Baptist church. Now we're going to do a quiz on churches again. How many of you are Baptists here? We got one, two Baptists. Okay. How many Lutherans? Raise your hands. Lutherans win. Lutherans win. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many of you are Catholics? I don't know why they don't have them around, do they, very much? Oh, yeah, they do. They do? Okay. They have some. All right. They're All right. Into history. Well, this is a, a, the, my now photo of this is, you know, kind of, uh, I have to say it's, it's a little sad. It's heroic, actually. Don't let him put himself down like that. No, I'll try not to, but it is a little sad. And I, but we've only had one s snowfall in the last couple of years, really, that stuck in any way, shape, or form. It didn't really even stick. I ran down there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This <laughs> February of 2017. I, I defend it because there's a little bit of snow on that fire hydrant. <laughs> I can tell you this guy's a trickster. He might have carried the snow with him and put it back. <laughs> there's, there's some on the car, too. There's some on the car, yeah. Yeah. All right. And I wasn't fooling for <laughs> So what here, that's first. In the van, what was the box in the middle of the road? Oh, the box in the middle of the road, Paul. Uh, you know, I think, uh, don't I? The truth is, I've often wondered that myself, and I've never been curious enough to ask the question. Newspaper so the box? answer it, I don't know. Who knows? A newspaper guy? To make not, not, a, not enough population to move a newspaper guy at the corner. Yeah, you'd have maybe four people passing. That'd be pretty Anybody cool. Anybody idea what that box would be? How about, uh, how about if it's full of uh, some kind of coal? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, a coal box. So for heat or for... Well, you can see the, corrosive, maybe. You can see the tracks running along next to it, so they had, they, they were already plowing through the snow. This is this is obviously six, not 64 inches, so uh, it's it's uh, it's days melting. after the, the melt began. Obviously. What? I'm sorry. What year again? It's 1880. 1880, rather. 1880. Oh, well, we did that. We're looking at the waterfront now. This is a Norwegian photographer, Anders Vilsa, who was only here for a few years in the 1890s. Uh, he, uh, he was called back to Norway by his wife. And uh, you want to tell that story? A little, just a little bit. She was with him here 
Then they were both called back. Okay. Go ahead, Frank. She, he was, he was told that if he could not return to Seattle, but if he wanted to continue to be married to his wife, he had to go back to Norway. When she got him back to, to Norway, then she trapped him there. <laughs> she said, we're not going back to Seattle. You're going to stay here. If you want to stay with me. So he did. She knew best. Well, she actually, perhaps she made the right decision because after he left Seattle, he became the national treasurer of Norway, the great photographer of Norway. He spent a few years taking pictures of Seattle. This is where I'm going to show you a couple of them. This is the waterfront. He's, his back is to Pike Street. He's looking south, east. This is late 1890s. And today, this same spot is looking at something that we're about to lose as well. Those are Gene's students. He teaches near here. Near here. Uh, go ahead, Gene. Tell me about yours. Well, it's actually a like teacher. It's, it's up Cougar Mountain. So it's not up there too near, but it's up above uh, East Cape. It's above Gene? you. Gene? Yeah. The, the one building, that little top of the brown building on the right, there by the tree. Yeah. This one right here. there. That's building that I think is in the first picture. Let's take a look. There are a lot of repeats from the before the uh, viaduct was built. In fact, we did a viaduct column last summer and showed pre-viaduct and post-viaduct, knowing that the viaduct, would, when it's taken down, would be revealed. Yeah, right. yeah. I think you're right. I don't know that those other, those other buildings oh, were there. Uh, I'm sorry, but I've got to get out now. Okay. Have you got that? I think the, yeah. the darker <laughs> buildings are gone, but the, that brown building I think is still good. That building is the Burke building, and that is at first, the second, first in Madison. No, no, pardon me, second in Madison. Second? Second in Marion, rather. Yeah. I don't think, no, that's not there. The Burke is new. That was taken down to build the federal building, you know, the tall federal building. So you may be right, but you may be wrong. But privately, and I'm going to go into my studio, I'm going to check it out, but I'm not going to tell you if you're right. <laughs> if you are wrong, however, if you leave your name and number, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> All right, is that deal? No, okay. <laughs> So here we are, a little bit further south, looking north. It's another Anders Wilson shot. And this is taken, in, again, 1898-99, in that six-month period when the gold rush was going on. Yeah. And you can see these, this marvelous little sign that says, aluminum houses only 150 pounds. So you can imagine these guys about to go up to the Yukon, ready to carry these, these huts on their backs. And uh, in that six-month period, about a hundred, more than a hundred vessels went from Seattle up to the Yukon. I have a feeling that an aluminum house in the Arctic would be colder inside than outside. <laughs> <laughs> what do they do? I wonder if they have it. Well, it's, it, at least you wouldn't have the wind, wind chill. Oh, that's a good design. This is uh, today. We're looking right about Coleman Dock. There's the Marion Street pedestrian overpass. And we'll go forward. So Anders Vilsa was so uh, prominent in Norway that in 2015 they released a whole series of stamps uh, with all of a huge number of his images. But I just love this one. I think it's really, he really, really was a special fighter. And who knows what would have happened. He might have been killed by Asim Curtis if he were, if he were <laughs> wandering the streets. Today. Or if he'd been married differently. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. But he made out in Norway. He did just fine. 1913, a year before the Smith Tower opened, the photographer climbed from Western Stevens, went up to the observation deck, which was not yet clad, uh, and shot down, looking northerly. And you can see up here, it was one of the first views from this spot in Seattle of Queen Anne. There's Lake Union. Wallingford up here. 
a pretty unique view, and no one had seen it except a handful of workers and the photographers that went up there. A year later, we could all go up and take a look. But keep your eye now. There's a, there's a couple structures I want you to watch for. This is the Rainier Club downtown. This is St. James Cathedral up on the hill. And there is Queen Anne High School up on. So watch and see if you can see any of these structures as we go to our modern view of, especially Lake Union. Keep an eye out for Lake Goat. <laughs> but we still see the Rainier Club and the Cathedral. They call it progress. They call it progress. But it has nice reflective surfaces. Good time of the year. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, to find the right. Well, here we are now. What's this? Anyone know? It's the Aurora Bridge. It is the Aurora Bridge, and there's a four master passing underneath the Aurora Bridge just before it's completed. The four master is called Amanda She likes this name so much, she wants you to repeat it with him. The Monongahela, are you ready? Not Not the the Isn't it lovely? It's a beautiful name. It's amazing. Wasn't <laughs> bass were that tall? Yes. And look at the masts. It, you know, this by 1931, four masters or, or sailing ships, big, the big freighters, they, they were totally useless, and it was being towed out. It would eventually, within a year or two, be sold to a Vancouver logging company, where it became a barge, and within another couple of years, it was it was a scuffle. That would be a useless. Uh, what did you call it? Oh, I, what did I say? You said totally useless, and you said it had a function. Oh, if the function would be as a barge, but not as a sailor. We we're, we're trying to correct you, and oh. you try to be so hard on these poor vessels. No, it's, a, it's, a sad, it's kind of a tragedy that we lost most yeah. of them. I mean, and that's one of the fishing fleet? And that was one of the big fishing fleet that went to Alaska? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This one? Yeah. You know, this this was actually a transatlantic, transpacific. No, it wasn't fishing at all. It was transpacific. Okay. This was a freighter. Okay, the, the, they had those big ships like that that also went up to Alaska and were right. the base ships for the yeah. fishing up there. Small boats would go off with them. Yeah, it's very good. Very good. Yeah. Very good, yeah. And, they, like the big trawl. and there was a big fleet of them that would go into Lake Union every year. And have and be it's part of it. So it this, may be a little older than that. It may, uh, Gene says I was there for several years. Yeah. Where did you learn that? In your call. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you guys do a stand-up or two. <laughs> it's in the book, Paul. It's in the book. So, do any of you know the song, it's in the book? So Monongahela is leading Lake Union. It's one of the last of the, of the four masters. Uh, the bridge is about to be finished. And I had to go back, and, and I, I really couldn't find a, a ship quite that large, but there is one in here. I, I did find some pretty clouds. And here we are. And the boat I found to, was a, was a, not a small boat. <laughs> that boat, um, so okay, okay, it's small. But this whole picture is a real teacher, because it shows us what he does. He went out there and visited the place five or six times, then he found this picture with the clouds the way they are, the reflections, the little flotilla of boats down below. You know, it's an absolutely beautiful picture as seen on North Lake Union. And we may say that he's generally got a genius for this kind of <coughs> persistence too. So when you buy this book for your cousin in Esperanto, New Jersey, this is, this is uh, an extra benefit for you and for us. And Paul, I'll give you your donut after the show. Thank you. So let's go forward now. I'm going to connect the gold rush with the opening of the Aurora Bridge. This is the Taft Key. It was given to President Taft in 1909 by George Carhart, who was the fellow who found the original claim in the Yukon, the first gold miner and everybody followed him. And he actually was one of the handful who became rich. Well, the, the tap key was made up of 22 nuggets of gold from his claim, and the key is solid gold. And it's mounted on a little slab of uh, Alaskan marble, and it was used by President Taft to open the Alaska-Yukon Pacific 
uh, our first World World's Fair in Seattle. So let's go forward now. We're going to look at the opening of the Aurora Bridge. The Tafki was used by presidents to inaugurate, uh, to set off the inaugurations of a number of notable events around the country. But in Seattle, it was special. And in 1932, we're looking at now, above where the Monongahela passed several months before, and the bridge is finished, we're looking at the crowd that streamed out on the bridge. Just before they streamed out on the bridge, Governor Roland Hartley from Everett, who was deeply opposed to the Aurora Bridge, levied against it, spoke against it throughout its construction, saw the crowds, realized that the support was enormous, and he started bloviating about uh, you know, the joys of an Aurora Bridge and how he was essentially responsible for that. <laughs> He's a Republican, by the way. <laughs> so there he was, and, and in uh, Washington, D.C., he was going on at such length that at 2.57 in the afternoon, the crowds are waiting on, the, on either, either side of the bridge. The fireboats are down below waiting to set off their, their hoses. And on, on, in Washington, D.C., Herbert Hoover, this is February 22, 1932, the 200th anniversary of George Washington, birthday, which is why, of course, it's called the George Washington Memorial Bridge. But here we are, and Herbert Hoover, 257, interrupts the governor and presses the key, and the fireboats send up their plumes, the flags unfurl, the crowds rush onto the bridge cheering, and, and uh, poor Hartley never finished his speech. <laughs> it is a shame. And here we are today. Now, I can't get there to the exact spot from it. So I now use my 21-foot extension pole to get up high. And that's one of the, uh, so maybe six, eight times throughout the book when the building or the structures or the, the scenery gets in the way, I, I push my camera up at the top of, a, of, a, of an enormous pole. And people often say, what is that pole? And I tell them it's the biggest selfie stick. <laughs> So here we are, and let's take a look at that moment when Herbert Hoover is setting off the, the, the festivities of uh, opening the Aurora Bridge. <coughs> there was another president who used this key in 1962 to open the World's Fair. And after he did so, uh, it was retired to the Smithsonian, where it is to this day. And the World's Fair, we will go there now, and you can see young Paul Adal, who was the nine millionth visitor to the fair. And Paula is surrounded by her parents up here in their very happy parents. She's the VIP for the day, and they got to tag along. She got an enormous dog, and behind her you can see her very unhappy sister. <laughs> And today, she is a teacher in Issaquah, and she has the nine million sign on her wall, and those are her students, opposed to the lobby of the, the front porch of the school. So was the, was the sister nine million and one, or was she eight, she nine, 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 nine? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's written there, it's nine million and odd. No, but was your sister who was asking? Was she the one before the one after? Oh, you don't know. You're thinking. <laughs> so here we are, 1889, Seattle Fire. Everything we're looking at burned down. 30, 30 acres, 30 blocks downtown. And here is the Fry Opera House with a guy standing. You can just make him out, right, looking over the fire. Everything burned. Everyone is rushing downtown to look at it. And up on the hill above, there's Lucy Campbell Coe peering down from her family <laughs> as a four-year-old. Four and there aren't many photographs because a lot of the photographers, like the Webster's, you know, like the Peterson Bros, were right down first to Cherry. They lost they, it. They lost it. So there aren't a lot of photographs of the fire itself. Here we are today, same spot, first and spring, <laughs> then Front Street and spring with my 21 foot pole. And now, two days later, the after effects of the fire. Or in the paper, this was called, this was captured, The Hideous Remains. 
And this is a significant corner in Seattle, and we're going to go there and then take a look at it. And look at this structure here. It's what the portico, Paul, what do you call this thing? Well, it's a flat iron building, right? It's shaped like an iron. So it's on a triangular block. And it's the one you know that's between Yesler, James, Second, and, and Pioneer Square, First Avenue. You know, it's that triangle. And here it is. It's right there. Well, what is on that triangle? What's the name of it? The Sinking Ship. ship. Sinking Ship Garage. Very good. If we had some extra cookies, we would give you one. <laughs> so we're going to go now to a picture from 1908. The hotel, the Occidental Hotel, this structure we just saw, was replaced very, very quickly afterwards by the Seattle Hotel. This is the Seattle Hotel in 1908, standing on that same footprint. And uh, by 1960, it was being torn down and turned into our sinking ship garage. Now, there's one silver lining, and it's a big one, because when the Seattle Hotel was torn down, it launched thousands of preservationists who said, never again are we going to allow something so beautiful to be turned into something so ugly. So ignore the Smith Tower as we go to the modern version of this, and just look at the sinking ship garage and mourn for just a moment. Here yeah. we go. We should have a little sympathy for the architects and the builders of the sinking ship who understood the sadness of many citizens, but explained that they really had their best uh, hearts in, 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 at work when they designed the building and when they repeated the qualities, the Romanesque architectural qualities that were in that neighborhood then built after the fire. And you can see it up on the top of the sinking ship garage with the curving, basket handle curving of the pipes up there. Compare those to the basket handle curving of the windows on the, on the, uh, the hotel building across the street. What's the name of that hotel? Uh, well, it's about the merchants. I don't remember the name. Is it the Knox? It's the merchants. That's it. Yeah, that's where actually I started my study of local history, which was on the history of the merchants. So you can see that we, we did lose the Seattle Hotel. It was replaced by something quite hideous, but it did save the Pike Place market. Victor Steinbrook and thousands of citizens said when the market was threatened in the late 60s, we're not going to let Wes Ullman tear it down. Wes was a good guy. Don't give it to Wes. Well, he, he was not a supporter. He was in favor of well, tearing it down. Uh, he, was a, he, he was a good guy, but he wanted to tear down the market. He was just looking for gold and Here's the market in 1907, right about the time it opened. And here it is today. What a lovely place. So Seattle and, and everywhere around us changes so quickly, we need to find places where we can go back and, and sort of touch down. The market's on the Oh, let's ask it. Oh, here you go. Okay, now you guys uh, put on your thinking skulls, your hats. Where are we looking here? What is this and what is, where is it? Come on, think about it. Look like my driveway. Look <laughs> like your driveway, that's very good. Where do you live? Maybe it is. <laughs> it does look like Enum Claw. Okay. Any other guesses? Not Skid Row, I think. No, it does look skiddy though. Skiddy, yeah. Pretty slippery. Lots of mud. Shall we, shall we look at the modern one and see where we are? Okay. Here's a shocker. Oh, 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 it's the freeway. That photo was taken in the mid-late 50s by Werner Lingenhager. And he knew that the, the big ditch was coming. He knew that it would be, we, we had this huge freeway running through the middle of town. So he went up and he took, a, he took photos all around, but he took these two photos, one looking south and another looking north. They're both side by side in the book. So you can kind of look down south and north on, on uh, Another, another uh, comparison that will really be very much enjoyed by your relatives <laughs> in Peoria, <laughs> Illinois. I don't have any relatives in Peoria. But they're relatives. How many of you have relatives? Nobody has relatives in Peoria. Uh, See, not in Indiana? No. No. What? 
Pittsburgh. Yeah, you'll, you'll represent everybody. Then. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Here we are at Third and Union. This is a federal building. It is actually um, uh, a building about built 1908, and it, it was significant enough, kind of a meeting place for Seattle at the time and for the next 50 years. And when you would say, "Meet me at the steps." Everyone knew that you meant these particular steps. They were made of chuckanut sandstone. And as were the, the, the front of the building columns. And what happened was, over the 50 years that that building existed, and it's a lovely building, it is the post office. And over the 50 years that that building existed, it was pooped on by a million pigeons. And evidently, that's an estimate. Really? <laughs> How many? How many people would be counting pigeons? Nobody. It's an estimate. It's an exaggeration, but that's what we. This is history, Paul. We exaggerate about everything. <laughs> so here, the, here are these Edwardians meeting on the steps, and the the uh, the city powers that were in the late fifties decided that it just was uh, that the the effects of the pigeon poop were were too. Uh, too great, and they decided they'd tear the whole building down. Oh they replaced it with this. Glass and steel. Now, no one I ever have met or known ever says, meet me at the box. <laughs> because what they replaced it with in, in, in the late 50s, early 1960, was a, a structure that some would say looks like a filing cabinet tipped on its side. Someone actually said that. They did. Yeah, yeah. And now, Uber. Oh, we can all say that together. Uber. Try that. Uber. Okay, let's try this one together. Pigeon poop. <laughs> this was taken from the BF Goodrich building, which no longer exists. My 21 foot pole couldn't have gotten me up this high, so. The Port of Seattle let me climb up on one of their big lifts, and I was up about 40 feet in the air, and you can just see the Smith Tower in this one, and today. Those were about 250 houses of the 500 on, the lo on this location, and taken obviously in the mid-30s. And we go today and forward. Okay, now, this, is 34th and Fremont Avenue. Wait a second, Gene. Yeah. What are you looking at there in your hand? Comparing. Oh, uh, there we you go. You don't believe that we're doing the same thing that was in the newspaper? <laughs> I'm, I'm paying attention. You're paying attention, I'll aren't you? I'll let you know. I'll raise my hand. You're a real student. That's <laughs> it for you. Right. Let's give her a hand for me. <laughs> no, that's why I'm here. Okay. You're checking on us. Do we get a grade at the end? You're going to give us a letter grade? Well, maybe a free book. Oh. Oh. No, 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 no. So no we, can't do that. we have to pay the printer. <laughs> that gives me an, uh, another reason to bring up the point of your uh, relatives in, in Peoria. No, no, no. no it's like Pittsburgh. We're missing Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, okay. Well, enough of that. <laughs> Here we are looking at one of the last one of the last uh, streetcars in Seattle before they went trackless and gasoline powered. And uh, 41, 19, 1941, yeah, right, Gene? Yes. Yeah. Those cars look familiar. My mother re remembered and, and grieved because she lived up in Wallingford above the hill here. This is Fremont. You can see the Fremont for the couple of Baptists. There's Fremont Baptist Church up there. <laughs> we had a story on that once, and they had an orchestra. They played at the service with their orchestra. So I, I had to go back and find something that would uh, that would match this the, the the trolley that was about to disappear forever from the streets of Seattle and be replaced by gasoline. <laughs> and I went back at the same location, and now I, I would ask that uh, all the born again. Folks, close yeah. your eyes. Close your eyes. Time. Close your eyes. You close your eyes. This is not. Close my eyes. Yeah, yeah, close your eyes. I, you're not. You should not. Well, if you look at it, I give you a warning right now. This I've is. I've probably seen it. You're probably wise too. That's fine. Okay. 
Okay, so trigger warnings right here. Okay, here we go. So here it is last year at the same oh, corner. The, uh, parade. Yeah. We <laughs> call this two women walking abreast. I get that. Two women walking abreast. Very good. Thank you, Gene. Okay. All right. Let's give Gene a pause. How many of you were at Fremont last year watching this? Yeah, you wouldn't admit it anyway, would you? You know, it's funny that, that basically the city of Seattle, they just, they, you can ride on this day without clothes from anywhere into the city. Can you really? You really can. Yeah, they, they, they pass it. So the cops don't pass it. It's a naked day. As long as you're under 30. As long as you're under 30. <laughs> Very good. What do you do? So this is the Go Hing celebration in Chinatown, six-day festival they held in 1921. You have lion dancers. What's magnificent about this is that the, the, the scenery really has not changed. The buildings are the same. The Hotel Milwaukee is still there. The Wing Luke Museum is just down the street here. To repeat this, I found, uh, I went a couple doors uh, to the west of the Hotel Milwaukee and found the Seattle Kung Fu Club, led by Master John Leon. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and so he was so sweet. He just turned 80 this year, and he's been teaching since 1960, and he was, uh, you know, he, he actually was a teacher of Bruce Lee at one point. And what, what's kind of magnificent about this is he said, oh, I'll just bring out the whole school. And so I arranged him one afternoon, and he brought them all out onto the street, and we, they brought out the lion masks, and the, isn't that marvelous, and the flags, and the, and so here he normal. is, standing right in the middle there. So not only was he good at Kung Fu, he was good at public relations. <laughs> he was very good. And he has a he has a West Seattle cop right here who, who when I was worried about taking over King Street for 10 minutes, said, don't worry, I'm a cop. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is on spot. their web page now. It so. should be. Oh, you guys all know where this is. Black River. Yeah. 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 So right. This is your river. <laughs> what happened to it? Yeah. It's in, it goes into the... Well, what happened to it? But in the ship canal, the locks. It goes into the lake. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's now a, a triple in culverts. No, it's due to the ship canal. Due to the ship canal. It does. The Black River, when they lo when we lower Lake Washington by nine feet, this is about 1906. It's a it's an excursion down the Black River. It was going from Lake Washington to the attempt to go to the Sound, but I don't think they made it all the way. But this is a lovely photo, and we return now to the Black River, not far from where we where we sit actually. So let's take a look. Rainier Avenue South, and this is Carl of the Brown Bear World Park Car Wash standing in for the celebrants on the Black River. And I guess there's a few places in uh, maybe a park in Tuck Willow where it burbles up and you see a little bit of the swamp. But for the most part, it's not navigable anymore. The Black River Riparian Forest, which is basically the stream that takes the ponds to the pumping station for the plug. Really? And so it's flood control now? Yeah, there's a big pumping station there with some ponds behind it, and it's preserved a uh, repairing area around it, uh, which is a nesting space for birds and so forth, and it's right immediately adjacent to the sewage treatment plant. Mm. To what? Sewage, sewage treatment, treatment plant. plant. Oh. Well, you learn things every time you go somewhere and every time you go somewhere. Once a year, it seems more. You can get a sand sniff there. Sorry, speak up. Certain times of year, you can see, you can get a sense of a, of a stream flowing through there, but it's a There's very a stream small yeah. trickle. There's a, There's a small stream that comes in from the south and, and to that particular oh, point. Oh, wrong <laughs> Wrong direction. Well, yes, it, it, it used to join the Black River gotcha. there. Yeah, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it feeds those ponds. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Well, here we are in a somewhat related slide. This is, the next time we do the show, whether we'll be able to get all that information in. <laughs> you know, I, I like the so I'll mention the sewage treatment plant. Okay, and the contributor. Yeah. Okay. We call it the Brown River. The Brown River. <laughs> 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 you get the cookie. Until they rebuilt the sewage, the sewage 
sewage treatment plant and upgraded it. <laughs> the, 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 it used to be just primary treatment, uh, or first stage treatment. Yeah, yeah. And the, the effluent from that went on the ditch that used to be the Black River into the Duwamish. And that was how it was fed out of that sewage treatment plant. Now there's a whole underground piping system that takes it out of the Alkai. But uh, for a long time, that was the main sewage uh, uh, thing for the whole south part of the county would come out there. Now it just chops it off into Tequila? No, now there's an underground con uh, culvert, big 10 foot oh, yeah, pipes that yeah. take it clear out to about two miles off Alki Point, or about 400 feet deep. Uh, yeah. That's nice. <laughs> well, here we are with the Brown children. This is, they were on the cover of Paul's first volume. Oh, they were very, very good to me. And I sold about uh, thousands and thousands of those books, and they really supported me for about two or three years. They're standing in the waters of Lake Union, and the photographer is looking to the southeast. What is that ridge up there then? The southeast, southwest looking. Capitol Hill. Yep. Yeah, and what is that uh, wooden trestle there? Come on, you can do it. It's the southwest corner of Lake Union. What would that trestle be? If we were looking at it today and we could see this spot, Amazonia. Amazonia would be right over here. That's, that's got to be East Lake. Not East Lake. Try a different direction. University of West Wesley? West Wesley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. This is the southwest corner. Oh, I thought you said southeast corner. Well, then you're excused, and I would uh, apologize <laughs> for not pronouncing east well enough to be distinguished from west. Sorry. Well, let's look at it today because the Lake, lake Union at this point is, is uh, well, there is no lake. Oh, I took a couple of neighbor kids, this is T and Leanna Owen, about 11, well, 2011 when we did the Mohai show together, and we, uh, we repeated this particular photo. It's several blocks from Lake Union, uh, all paved. The, the land is, is, uh, is now filled with lovely buildings, and I went back like the one, like the one behind them. And uh, I went back this year just for, to get a portrait of the two of them six years later. Oh, fun. And here's Tia and Liana, and Tia now can drive. Oh my God. <laughs> Which is terrifying when you live across the street from a young driver. <coughs> there we go. <laughs> it never fails. You know, the one spot in the show, after 20 shows, that we know is that everyone will go, ooh. And they're sincerely <laughs> interested, yeah. Everyone loves the car. <laughs> So why didn't we save it? That's what I want. With that kind of response, it's the one slide in the show that that everyone, every single audience has the same response. We know it, we just wait for it, and we look at each other and say, uh-huh. Yeah. Coming through the locks. Coming through the locks. Palakala is coming through the locks. And look at these folks, this is 48. Look at these folks lined up all across. So this kind of part of a celebration. Has it been cleaned and it's going back to the sound? There's the tugboat of towing it. I think they just had a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, special tours on the boat, and someone financed one to go in through the canal. And it was the first time I went through the locks, first time. Well, look up here. Maybe the only time, actually. Maybe the only time. Look up here, you'll see the wheelhouse. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. But I want to now move forward. I had to find something that would, that would in some way reference or match the Kalakwa. So we're gonna. I went back to the to the locks in, in spring of 2017 and found a big boat. This is the USS Turner Joy, and I did not know at the time, but this is the one of two boats that that were in the Gulf of Tonkin with the USS Maddox. And of course, the Gulf of Tonkin uh, led to the resolution to pull us into uh, a pretty devastating war. Uh, and uh, the USS uh, Turner Joy is a, is a museum ship across the bay in uh, Bellingham, right now. And it, it had just been cleaned in the That would be the Vietnam War, uh, was it 51,000? How many Maybe more. Maybe more. So 
It was dry docked in Lake Union? It was, I don't think it was dry docked, but they did, they did a complete, uh, you know, they did a big paint job, and I could see all the tarps as I, as I was waiting for it to emerge, so I was watching from, as I drive down I-5, I could look down and see it being uh, restored, but they did a, they did a beautiful job, and uh, the director called me, and there it is off the coast of Vietnam around that time, it was decommissioned in 82, I think it ended up off the Falklands, kind of monitoring uh, the, the British and the Argentinians, and then, really? yeah. And here, remember <laughs> that wheelhouse? Clay Eels, the editor of our book, is a West Seattleite, and he went Wait, down. Stand up, Clay. Stand up. You're going to do something. You're going to do something for us. <laughs> he went down to uh, Salties in West Seattle, and right in front of Salties, here is the wheelhouse, one of the last little bits and pieces of the block. And he took two shots, one looking at it, and you can see the, the, uh, the windows from the outside, and let's look at it. Here's a kind of a poignant shot, looking back across Elliott Bay. And now Clay is going to demonstrate for you, he's a horn player, and he's going to now demonstrate for you the clock Well, okay. um, how many of you rode on the clock There are some here. What an experience it was. I was in high school in 1967, the last month it was on the run. And it really affected me deeply. Our, our stage band was going to Belmont to Bremerton for the Olympic College Stage Band Festival. And you step on that boat, and when it starts going, the motors are loud, and the whole thing is cavernous, and spider webs everywhere. You couldn't go to the second floor. They closed it off. And the motors, you felt like the walls were going to come in. It was all the way across the sound of Bremerton for an hour. It was a boat that would give you a headache. It was like being next to a, six, a single stroke engine on the water. Yeah. <coughs> some, some people liked it. It wasn't always a headache. You know, my wife has to go every year and have an MRI, and I think of the Kalakala as the marine version of an MRI, if any of you have had it. It's climbing and better. Is that still down there? When did you take this picture? When did you take this picture? Uh, about three weeks ago. Oh, it's still there. Oh, oh still you can there. go see it. Just go down to Salty's on Alki and Harbor Avenue, and it's, it's sitting in the parking lot along with the drivetrain. It's just sitting out in the elements. And the drivetrain looks like a dinosaur's backbone. Uh, visit the Log Cabin Museum, which is the home of the West Seattle Historical Society, which uh, Clay ran for better part of uh, seven years, six, seven, almost exactly. Until I got hooked up with this I book. Can't say a million, I can't say a million birds and you can say seven years. I put it there simply so you could object. <laughs> Here we are now. This is the beginning, and we're about to see the end of an era of the viaduct. So this is before it opened in 1953 in April. And you'll see as we do our comparison that the only things that really repeat are the Smith Tower and the color red. What, what year did it open to? It opened in 53. <coughs> so it's, it's been, uh, uh, and it's just about to close, I think January 11th, they're going to close it down, and it's time for traffic nightmare time. Now that was uh, unfortunate that he would say that, because I was hoping to, uh, again, take a poll among you people regarding your attitude towards replacing the viaduct with the tunnel. So I uh, would, uh, do you have, have, do you, have, you have uh, opinions about that? And you prefer the viaduct to be gone and the tunnel to replace it? Raise your hand, please. We have one person. Those who want, two people. That's four. I saw four. Was there four? Yeah. Those, however, who want the glorious Viaduct, <laughs> with great views and tremendous uh, memories regarding, for instance, the sounds of the clock clock. <laughs> if you prefer that, raise your hands, please. Nobody? Oh, <laughs> now, Clay is one of the great 
defenders of the environment. <coughs> now, when we did the show in West Seattle, it, it really, it was 95% were supporters of the environment because it's, it's going to make their lives very difficult. It's our lifeline. Same thing only when they're traveling. Same thing with the Ballard. You know, they didn't care for The northbound me. view is spectacular. Northbound view is well, even the south. I like both, both directions because you look into the windows. Where do you look? Yeah. Uh, Bellevue. But I go to Shulshul a lot, and so the northbound view of yeah. uh, is just spectacular. Yeah. Okay. We're going to look now, just as a little sideline, we're going to take a look at this building. And it's one that Paul, and I, and Clay have come to admire. It's brand new. We, we still we didn't know why, but we sort of did. Go ahead. Well, it's it's it, when I took this photo, the top it's not quite the top isn't quite finished. Let's look at it down below. Uh, this is a shot I took just last week. There it is. It's called the F5 building. Those odd uh, triangular shapes. This it actually seems to. Dejoint a certain one when you see it. It does, and look, it kind of ducks in at the bottom here, too. And it's right around the Methodist church and the top. It's a very strange structure, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what, why it was so I odd and appealing. Is that the Christian Science Church? That is, it's a Methodist church. Methodist. This one down here. That's the old Seattle Church. Christian Science Church is the one, the first Christian scientist is now called Town Hall, and it's up on. And we'll talk about that after. I've got some good photos of that. But this is this is a lovely structure. We couldn't figure out quite why it was so appealing. And then we found out that the the developer Eric Daniels had commissioned an architectural firm to uh, seek out and portray the qualities of grace and. Uh, 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 is it enough? Is it enough? Uh -huh. The qualities of a Belgian-born actress. Which you all may be familiar with. Oh, okay. Audrey Hepburn was the inspiration for, for this. I, I'm serious. They had a picture of her in the lobby as they were building it, and so this and this is the picture that they had, and this is from, of course, the movie. Sorry, I said of course, Paul. The fic, the picture from the movie. What's the movie? Naturally. What's the movie? Oh, uh, come on, tell us, guys. Breakfast at Tiffany's. Does anybody remember the song? What is the, big, the, the most popular song? Moon River. Moon River. Oh, let's sing along. Moon River. Why is it hard? I'll run to you in style someday. <laughs> I think you're on your own. Wait a second. The thing that always mystified me about that song was a lyric. It comes through the end, and we're not going to get there. But it, is, it refers to your certain friend, Huckleberry Friend. Huckleberry, Huckleberry, Huckleberry Friend. I like to know. I think it's summertime. I think it's when the huckleberries come out. It's like one month a year. The Huckleberries come out. Okay, I just found it very strange at the time. <laughs> I frankly alienated me against her and the movie. <laughs> and the building. <laughs> but you like the, the building. You no, like no, no. I'm so, no you don't the like building it. is soured by Huckleberry. You didn't, you've never mentioned Huckleberry before. No, I, made it, it up. Against I made it up again. Okay. <laughs> well, let's take one last look. Well, look at the, her cigarette holder and the cant of her hips. And then, here we go. Yeah. There yeah. it is. Right. All right. <laughs> sure. You get it. Well, yeah. Yeah. You kind of get it. Looks like Will yeah. Chamberlain. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna jump now up to North Seattle. This is Greenlight, 1903, and again a picture of loss because there you get nothing there except these mountains right there. You get a little bit of the Cascades peeping up over the. Kind of I mean, you've got an awfully nice neighborhood. The Olympics. But, yeah, neighborhood in which Gene lives. Gene lives in this neighborhood, does not really It's a nice neighborhood, neighborhood but it doesn't right? look very nice from here. There's the Olympics, and here's... Is that 70th? <laughs> this is about 70th, yeah, you've got it. Is it 70th Street Overpass? It is. is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So... We're almost at the end now, but we're, we want to go back 
to the oldest structure still standing in Seattle. This is it. <coughs> Where is it? Who knows it? It is West Who Seattle. knows it? I thought the Burma House was the oldest. What's that? Is it the Burma House? What did you think what? I thought the Burma House up by the old coal fields was the oldest house in King County. Lima. Lima. Lima House. Lima. We're talking about Seattle. I know it may be. <laughs> Where is this this Burma house? The Burma <laughs> house, yeah. What is it? It was up by where the old Newcastle coal mines were. Mm -hmm. oh. What's the date? What was the, what the date of the house? Eighteen uh, sixty. I don't remember. Well, that's eighteen sixty-two. So. But it's but ours been still, lived in all all these years. It's so still is standing. Continue oldest continuous. Oldest continuous. Wow. Well, in, in Seattle proper, this is it. And okay. what's interesting about it is it was built by Doc Maynard. And he built it when he moved out to Alki. He traded his property in downtown Seattle and bought up uh, for 320 acres on, in West Seattle. And uh, it was right on the beach when he, when he built uh, his, his first house, which burnt down and was replaced by this one in the early 1860s. And then uh, and his, he and his wife Catherine lived out there. And uh, they started a farm which was not very successful. Paul got this photograph from a significant Seattleite who was a member of this family. His mother is standing in the white apron at the door. Wow. Who would that be? Can't you tell that that's April Hagland, Ivers' oh. mother? Oh. Actually, her name then was not Hagland. Oh. Yeah, she wasn't married to uh, Ivers' dad yet. Her name then was, was Nelson. No, I'm making the wrong hands. Hands. These Scandinavians really confuse me. That's because I'm a Lutheran, you see, I'll trace the Lutheran. Well, they're all Lutherans, really. <laughs> so there, there is his, his mom, and there's his grandmother, and there's his grandfather. And this is uh, Cousin Snidely. Cousin <laughs> <laughs> Snidely, that wasn't his name. But it's kind of appropriate because uh, the mother, uh, Ivor's mother, had, was the youngest of the children. And she was born in 69. The only one born of all the kids in the United States. And that, that was right here on Elkie Point. And, uh, she was given more property in the will because she had the responsibility of taking care of the parents when they were dwindling in their death. And one of the daughter's husband, Whipley Snidelash, what's his name? Snidely Whiplash. Snidely Whiplash. Uh, he, he fought that. He, he thought because he was married to the daughter had three kids, but she didn't have any children yet. That, that they should get more money, which uh, you can sort of understand that, but but they he lost in, in, in the court. I think you can already see some of the bitterness there. You see, I think that Snidely's son right here peeing on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a mark of disdain. You know. That's part of the, we have a lot of motifs. <laughs> and, and we have also the, the grandsons pee and Pigeon poop yeah. It's what know. sells. It's what sells. That's right. Dirt. Well, let's look yeah, right. at this house today because it's still there and it's still lived in. And, but it is unmarked. You have to go up 64th Avenue. There's no oh, plaque or there's no, nothing on the street. There's nothing that says this is the house that Ivar once lived in. This is the house that that uh, Doc Maynard built. You did, did you think they would no, say that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the people who are the protectors of uh, historical structures have criteria that you have to meet, or they prefer that you meet. It's true to say that this is the oldest house, but it's also been changed quite a bit. Not a lot, but quite a bit. And that somewhat creates an ambiguity that they'd rather run from. It also would cost a heck of a lot of money to to do anything that, that was significant with this place because suddenly you'd have people walking there and looking at it. The address, however, <laughs> is in the book. Oh, so good. Yeah. You have to walk there. It's in the book. Could you go, and if you can go back? Them, yeah, let's go back. <laughs> if you can wow. convince people who live there to open the basement door and it's on the south side of the house, you will see the original foundation timbers, which are raw. 
Spinoza and were hammered on by Doc Maynard. Let's, uh, but what, one of the Hanson family actually came to one of the shows and she claimed, we don't know if this is the case, she claimed that this was an add-on, that, like, <coughs> that that was added on later after the Hansons bought it, and that the original structure was closer to this one, which doesn't have that add-on. Well, you can't tell what that one is because of the tree. You got huckleberry but. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, I know very good. Sure, good. Yeah. You know, you're so good at finding these connections because you're from around town. <laughs> Not no. all. No. Not all. Where is he from? Here he's from yeah, Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> so let's go forward now. There's the plaque at the end of the street, but it doesn't tell you where the house is. So it just tells you that you're in the general vicinity, a block away. <laughs> guys are coming to the end of the show now, if you want to leave early, stay <laughs> right. Last two slides, you want to escape, this is your last chance to get away. This is Kiki Soglu, or Princess Angeline, who was named Princess Angeline by Catherine Maynard, Don Maynard's second wife. And Doc was a friend of Chief Seattle's, and, and uh, Catherine Maynard was a close friend of Kiki Soglu. And in fact, Doc Maynard was Chief Seattle's doctor. It's in the book. It's in the book. And you've never heard that song. In the book. It's in the book. Or was that a, that was a sermon? It was a sermon. Was it a it was a sermon with music. Yeah. It's in the book. Yeah. Well, the, the music accompanies it. So this is Princess <coughs> Angeline sitting on her porch below Western Avenue, right below the Pike Place Market. She's the daughter of Chief Seattle. And she, uh, for, for the better part of a century, no one knew exactly where this house was until the courageous Ron Edge and Paul triangulated a number of photos, looked at stumps, looked at dogs, looked at eaves, and they discovered that she was in this location. And Ron and I went back last November, and we, we really pinpointed where she, where she lived. And here's Ron, oops, sitting on the front porch this is the Pike Place Market Garage to the left. This is the fixed the door building to the right, and a half block down is the is the Pike Place, uh, the Pike Hill Climb. Can citizens and, and citizens visit this place, Jane? They cannot. There's big gated fences. You can only go here if you have the one door that opens out onto it from the from the apartment building to the right. But does Clay have a solution for that? does have a partial solution. Well, if you want to see this, even though it's uh, cordoned off by a fence, you can go to the Pike Place Market, and you all know where Lowell's Restaurant right. is. Mm -hmm. Take your food up to the second floor, look out the window, and it's straight down straight below down. you. Wow. You see the, gra the greenery. So if you're looking over Western Avenue, right. which is on the other side of those trees, mm -hmm. yep. Up above those bamboo. If we looked at the historical photo, we can see Western Avenue. You want to back up? Yeah, you see those that fence on the right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, on the uh, west side of Western Avenue. Mm -hmm. Is that an outhouse? Or down near. I think it might be an outhouse, yes, or it well, could be a cool house too. What's that? That new house yeah. is right where the outhouse is. <laughs> yeah. But we, I'd like to move on to the next subject here. <laughs> so our final comparison of the of the evening is again we return to Princess Angeline and her father. There's Chief Seattle in set. She's sitting here in what is today. Thank God she's not standing. She's not standing. She was not very that small. No, she's. She's squatting here. A lot of photographs were taken of Princess Angeline. We don't know who took this photo in, in early 1890. Uh, it was, uh, uh, but she would pose for photos and take a few pennies for, for posing. Uh, she worked as a laundress, as a basket weaver, as a, uh, uh, and was well known around Seattle. Here she is posing below. There's First Avenue or Front Street behind her, running behind her. She's posing in what is now Post Alley, and that is a long pike in uh, 1890, headed down towards the waterfront. And uh, we have them sitting here together because we found two direct descendants of 
Kiki So Blue and Chief Seattle. And one of them is, let's just go there. This is same spot. Oh my goodness. Mary Lou Slaughter, who is a basket weaver and shawl weaver out of cedar and a, and a hat weaver and a real extraordinary artisan. And Ken Workman, who's wearing one of Mary Lou's cedar shawls. Mary Lou is the great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki Sobu of Princess Angela. Great, 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 four. And Ken Workman is the great, 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 great grandson four. of Chief Seattle through his second wife. So the two of them came and graced the, their, the, the market with their presence, and, and uh, <coughs> we spent 10, 15 minutes taking their pictures. And Clay actually stood behind me with another camera, so you can see, <coughs> as I'm taking this photo, Ken kept turning around and finally said, Gene, take the photo. Uh, if someone wants to get through. And I said, I, 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 later I asked him, what are you talking about, Ken? And both Clay and I didn't see anyone behind him. He said, well, someone, someone kept tapping me on the elbow. And so his interpretation is it was a, it was a familial tap, a distant cousin, reminding him that once upon a time. Never put it that way before. I know. Well, this is our 20th show. I mean, it's cheap. A decade old show. I'm getting tired too. 20 right. shows, I'm mm -hmm. 80 years old. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Too much. Anyway, so Ken really found this uh, nudge from history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the way I feel. I can understand it, not quite so literally, but I feel when I'm taking a photograph and, and I'm looking in the same spot that a photographer stood and appeared 100 years ago. Everything falls into place, and I feel that little, like when the Rubik's cube flips around, and all the colors are. Gene you know, had a brilliant uh, solution to my tiredness because uh, Clay added one more show to the 22 we're doing, and that was on television on Channel uh, Five at eight in the morning or something. Oh my gosh! So now I go to bed at six in the morning. I do. I go to bed at 6 in the morning. I'm not set for that. I'm not an 80-year-old man with bad knees. So Clay came up with a solution. Clay, what is it? No, no, not Clay. No, it was Gene came up with a solution. Well, we're going to bring Ken Workman onto TV, the guy in the photo here, to tell his story about the photo. Yeah, you bet. Yes, so... So if you're watching New Day... New Day Monday, Northwest at 11 o'clock Monday morning. Monday morning. Okay. You'll, you'll probably see us if we haven't collapsed in a, in a small puddle. But uh, this, you'll see the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. And uh, he's a swell guy, sweet guy. And he looks like he's from Central Casting, you know? He really does. He's the, He's the George Clooney of the Guam. Uh, this guy looks like he's from Central Cast. Uh, uh, no, he looks like a Korean. Uh, believe me, he's not. He looks like a Romanian. He, he does. He, he looks, looks like Romanian. a Romanian priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best joke that I think. So thank you very much for coming. We we direct you if you if you're interested in looking at all the background materials behind the book, all of the original columns are in PDF form. Uh, on, the, on our blog, which is pauldorpad.com. You can click through and you can see all of the columns that appear in the book in their original form. You can compare the two. Uh, they're, um, they don't exist anywhere else. This, this kind of shocked us. Over the last couple of years, we thought, oh, certainly the Seattle Times will have an archive. They don't. They don't have anything that goes back 37 years. So slowly but surely, we're uh, scanning and posting all of Paul's columns for almost 40 years, and they will be up on the blog, pauldorpan.com. Yeah, and Clay. That's a bit of an oversimplification, and because those of you who use your library card sometimes access the online Seattle Times archive going back to the 1890s, they do have an incredible archive but for some reason, they have not kept most of the now and then columns in their archive. And most of the ones they've kept, 
they've kept the words, but not the photos that go with them. So this is going to be an incredible resource on pauldorpat.com. Eventually, we will have all 1,800 columns posted there, and they will not exist anywhere else except for in somebody's basement. <laughs> yeah, the original is still in Paul's basement. <laughs> oh, no, you can link them to anywhere, though, so it means they'll be everywhere. Right. And we strongly advise you to speak to your children about linking the, uh, this archive <laughs> to in their addition, own blogs. And, uh, every week, Paul spends a considerable amount of time uh, not only <laughs> writing the newspaper column, but if you visit pauldorpan.com uh, soon after, on a Saturday, you will see a column that's about 20 times the length of the Seattle Times column, filled with dozens and dozens of photos Is that and references. Play with me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Much bigger. Enormously. Now, don't do it on Saturday. Do it on Sunday, on the day that the... And you can click through yeah. and see, also, you can enlarge all these photos to screen, to fill your screen rather than look at the little shots that are in the Times. Yeah. So visit pauldorpet.com and we'll, you'll, you'll see a lot. And here's the books, and I'm going to oh, we're, we're going to proceed forward. For this group. I, there's more than more books here than the uh, size of the group, I think. That's right. So please come and buy lots of books. Remember those are all of those in the Midwest. And <laughs> that it's Christmas. Thank you so much. For coming. <laughs> My height. Ed was six foot seven. Yeah, he was a big kid. He was always so big. So how many did you have? Start. So you this are. I am. I am Gene Sherard. My dad's name is Sherard. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for so coming. So we'll let you buy one. I wouldn't have missed you it. to be good. Generic. <laughs> um, I would like this one dedicated to my son. K A K A Erickson E R I C K S O N. And you are the okay. So it's your son K A K. He goes by his initials K and A. Is it so K K dot A dot K dot A Erickson E R I C K S O N. E R I C K K S O N. Okay. So however you guys want to do it, we'll make a nice because he's the one who's been. Shooting a lot of historical photos of old buildings, post offices, bridges, and he would really like to publish a book on bridges. I don't know if, where he should go to try to publish it's, something. It's you know the place to go if you're doing a community history is uh, what's the Ar 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 Arcadia. Arcadia Press. Okay. If you're doing something that's that's of interest to, but they're the only they're the only game out there for doing what they're doing. Oh, he shot they do. so many bridges, uh, and and right. he's tried to get information on some of the bridges from the State Department of Transportation, and they say, well, we you don't we don't know anything about those yes. bridges. Wow. In fact, the, the person who's the expert is K. A. Erickson. And he says, that's me. <laughs> so, I mean, he knows about bridges that are not even on their listing. Wow. Um, <laughs> well, that's great. I, I just gave him lover of history and beautiful bridges. He loves them. He wow. loves bridges. Yeah. He's right there. Okay, let's trade. Paul, take this one. This is to his son, K. A. Erickson. I won't take the one I gave to you. Okay, don't take the one you gave to me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I've been just stuff for a long time. I know Murray Morgan because uh, I worked at the Tacoma Bay for the industry for a lot of years. And so I knew, knew Murray, and, uh, and he taught at Tacoma Bay for a lot of years. No, I never took a class for him, but I, he, he signed one of his books, Puget Sound. Yes. Oh, all right. He signed that one, and, and he knew that I covered mountains.